what I'm going to talk about is management of thoracolumbar spine trauma stabilization, some perils and pitfalls. I wasn't going to give a thoracolumbar spine lecture to fifth year residents and fellows. Um, I would want you to be a little bit more savvy about it. So no disclosure. So basically the objectives would be to talk about uh, thoracolumbar fracture overview, review of the classification systems. Believe you me, um, it's important to always have a refresher on these classification systems. They don't move very much in terms of people's bias to using that, but it's always good to be familiar, as Dr. Shaffrey said, when you're speaking versus when you're reviewing the papers or actually uh, critiquing papers, as some of you end up doing. And also the non-operative treatment, which not, very little has changed with thoracic lumbar fracture management at this time. And also the operative treatment, and I'll intersperse it with some case examples. So we sort of have an idea of thoracic lumbar uh, fracture. Um, the thoracic lumbar junction is the most commonly injured portion of the spinal column, believe you me. 20 to 20 percent of all traumatic fractures in young adults. Uh, and it's about 5,000 of them have neurological deficit out of 15,000 major uh, thoracolumbar injuries which occur every year in the uh, U.S. So at this point, the areas that have increased uh, increased uh, chances of being fractured are, is not the T1 to T10 area because it's buffered by other elements, um, the ribs, uh, et cetera, and also the sternum, but it's actually the transition zone, T11 to L2, maybe even T10, where the floating ribs are. And basically, you're moving from a stable kyphotic, as you remember, uh, stable kyphotic uh, thoracic spine to a more mobile lordotic spine. And there's all these transitional forces, rotational and shear forces that um, can be uh, impacted during high, high energy uh, uh, trauma. So the, as you know, the anterior column provides 80% of the axial load bearing, while the posterior column resists torsion and also shear forces. So that all comes into play when you start thinking about how things are classified, what kind of mechanism of injury that we're going to uh, experience. So there's always a combination of both flexion, axial load, lateral compression, rotation, distraction, shear extension that results in injury. And so by recognizing this, that's how so uh, predominant uh, classification of our uh, thoracolumbar injuries uh, systems are, are sort of uh, defined. And also, we have to determine the neurological injury um, associated with it to, to augment our decision making in terms of treatment. So it's not everything that you see on the radiographic image portends the uh, level of injury. So you can, if I could say, ask a whole bunch of uh, surgeons in a room, describe this fracture. Um, de 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 depending on the crowd, if it's international, you can have people with an AO classification system. Um, so the newer method, the thoracolumbar injury classification uh, system, versus those who still remain with the three-column model, which seems to be the derivative whenever we're discussing uh, injury classification. So, let's see. There you go. So there's not really a universally agreed upon classification system. The ideal one should be simple. It should be include vast majority of injuries, uh, should reflect the mechanism of injury when you're communicating amongst providers, and also should correspond to the anatomic pathology as best as you can to help determine the treatment options and also determine prognosis if possible. So as I mentioned, the three column uh, theory uh, is the most fundamental uh, descriptive uh, uh, descriptive pattern of injury for thoracic lumbar spine. And everybody is aware that we talk about the anterior uh, column made out of the anterior half of the vertebral body with the annulus, as well as the, uh, the middle column being the posterior half of the vertebral body and the annulus. And then the third column, which is the posterior column, involving the pedicles, the lamina facets, ligamentum flavum, and also the interspinous process uh, 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 and ligaments. And in defining that, the, this is more of the verbal description that you can give over the phone. Um, typically, it, it's not ideal um, to, to call some of the founders of the thoracolumbar injury classification system at 3 a.m. and said, you know, this person who was on an ATV uh, jumped through a mud pile and he has a uh, T-Lex score of nine. Okay, so that, that's sort of, 
in, immediately some of you will get it, it means some of your uh, boss's uh, attendings will sort of be blurry eyed and start drilling it down to the components of it. But everybody understands sort of a compression fracture, or you can just code it and say it's non operative. The canal is intact, the ligaments are intact, versus they have a stable burst. There's some canal occlusion, there's some angulation, there's some communication of the uh, vertebral body um, or even posterior elements. But uh, sorry, or, but there's no posterior column injury versus an unstable burst fracture where there's some disruption of the posterior elements. And typically, you can also have the uh, flexion distraction injury or even a chance fracture, which these days are getting rare and rare then you can also have the morbid fracture dislocation. So it's moving in terms of the level of severity and, and what do we do about these? Typically, the best idea will be one that includes a, a mention of the neurological deficit of the patient. That was the big failing of the uh, AO classification system. It came by about over 20 years ago. There's been modif modifications of it subsequently, but for nearly uh, 20 years, it, it was all based on the uh, in a comprehensive classification system that could guide treatment, but very little preponderance on, on neurological uh, deficit. Basically, they had three, three major groups, compression, uh, distraction, and also rotation. That's the C group, and literally that also involved impaction fractures or split fractures and also the uh, burst fractures. And then the B group that had distraction also had posterior ligament uh, disruption, osseous disruption anterior. So you can see we're getting into the weeds here. And you have the C group. And then you have 53 classification system for each one. And that's what Dr. Schaffer was alluding to, saying he would talk to somebody over at uh, Davos and say, this person had a B2-2. And, and even though the person was from Switzerland, there'll be sort of a blank stare because not, not everybody could memorize 53 different classification system. So in view of the fact that the three column injury was very broad, the AO system was too thick, there was not a whole uh, dependence on the patient's neurological deficit that could coach outcome and also the expedience of surgery. So in around 2005, sort of in the middle of my uh, res residency, the the, a group of both orthopedic neurosurgeons got together. They came up with the uh, thoracolumbar injury uh, severity score, which also included injury morphology, integrity of the posterior ligamentous complex, and neurological status. How many of you here use that system in teaching or in, in your, in, in your uh, institution? Okay, that's very good. How many of you use the AO classification system? Okay, how many of you use a mix of both? And who talks to the attending using a three-column injury all the time? Well, that's, pretty, that's pretty evident. So you can see there's no standard um, currently, but it's important just for reviewing literature, important for discussing outcome, important for uh, understanding, um, understanding the natural uh, treatment algorithms to, to have a good grasp of all three currently uh, that's well used. So, this system, as, as you all know, has a, has a point system given to the injury morphology where you can have a compression versus rotational versus distraction injury. And you only pick the, the morphologic uh, subgroup that scored uh, with the highest one when there are all multiples. So, so if you can have a compression fracture with translation, you go with, with the uh, translation rotation as opposed to um, giving a point for compression. And then you also look at the posterior uh, soft tissue point system, which is evaluated by MRI, CT, or even plain x-ray, or even the exam. If the patient has a quote unquote, a splayed, thin person with a splayed back, um, when you log roll them in the uh, trauma bay, you kind of expect that and without deep palpation to increase their, their injury. And then you have the neurologic point system. So at the uh, thoracolumbar junction, we're worried about cordoequina injury, we're worried about nerve root damage, we're worried about cord itself, and also we're, worried if, we're less worried if they are intact. So you ag agglutinate all these points and you have a scoring system. The most important thing to mention is the clinical qualifiers, okay? That, that makes or breaks a lot of these point systems. You have to be aware that there are open fractures involved. Um, it could turn an operative to a non-operative or vice versa, or a delayed operative case. Okay, do they have overlying burns that need to be sorted out first? Are they not going to be mobile? So we need to attend to 
other uh, traumatic issues versus they are so morbidly obese. You have a 400 pound, five foot two person and you're thinking about putting them in a brace, you know that's not gonna be a good idea from the get go. Um, versus if the patient has ankylosing spondylitis versus any metabolic bone disease, you, you should be aware of how do you treat these outliers. And that's a separate um, talk altogether in terms of the uh, treatment of uh, patients with metabolic bone disease and in, in the setting of trauma. So you also have to worry about the general health of the patient, whether they have a closed head injury or, 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 or their age also. So we, we sort of have injuries with three points or less with a thoracolumbar injury classification system, non-operative, with, with also attention given to the qualifiers. And then those with injuries, four points, it's a surgeon uh, Descript is a surgeon choice versus non op versus operative based on the qualifiers. I, again, I can't stress how important the qualifiers are versus injuries with five points or more. Typically, we lean towards um, operative treatment. I'm going to, interest of time, maybe. So you sort of follow this algorithm where you identify fractional morphology, assign points, you assign points for the posterior lung. Uh, longitudinal complex, and also you assign points for the ne neurology, and then you consider the clinical qualifiers before you provide treatment. So an example is a healthy 35-year-old uh, uh, gentleman who fell from a ladder scaffold. He's neurointact. He's got a burst fracture, um, two points, neurologically intact, zero points. The PLC is intact, so that's zero points. So two points, you want to brace this gentleman. Um, you can see it doesn't... Uh, uh, need any surgical intervention versus a 38-year-old gentleman belted seat belt driver. He's got complete uh, uh, paraplegia at that level. Um, he's got burst fracture. He's got neurological injury. He's got the PLC is disrupted. You can tell from the x-ray. You don't need to get an MRI um, at that point. Um, and he's got seven points. So that's operative. Okay. So this has been validated. There's been a lot of back and forth with that. But by 2006, it had been nicely validated. It's been employed. You guys, um, when we were in the middle of our residency, we went from a three column to the AO, and it was brutal. So at least there's some sense and sensibility in terms of talking to, um, you know, amongst residents. And also, uh, it, though it may not be all the time on your boards, uh, it's actually ideal to, to have a good sense of what you're saying um, when you discuss it. But there's been critiques about it lately, surgeon bias, it's all about treatment. It's um, it basically, the, they were saying that there wasn't any, uh, any good, other than expert opinion, there wasn't any good data to back um, any, any of, of what they were saying. But it really, it works, okay? It's, it's, uh, it considers the most important decision points before you treat somebody who needs to be uh, treated um, rapidly for mobilization, etc. It's simple and it's easy to teach trainees. So I would like you to all familiarize yourself with one based on what your institution uh, uses so you have a concise, easy way of discussing um, uh, thoracolumbar fractures versus having a mishmash of trying to get a three column into a, a into a telix but a, a telix classification system and even worse try to use the AO classification when you're interacting with providers it's a good system for classifying injuries if you want to write a nice succinct paper with a large database but um, from day to day practice is rather hard they try to accommodate that by 2013 by uh, modifying that system. So if Dr. Chapman was here, he would raise his hands and quickly say, if we've changed it, it's much better now. But really, they added the neurological status and key modifiers. If you're trying to get your PGY2s or your junior residents to, to, to come on board with something that they as first uh, respondents in the emergency room can succinctly call you at home and give you the, the to and fro before you call on attending or, or anything, you, you have the choice of giving them this flashcard in your pocket or giving them the uh, Tilix flashcard in your pocket. And, and that's pretty symptomatic. And you can just go through that with them quickly. And I, I just say pick one. But to be honest, it's easy to translate the Tilix system, in my opinion, to an attending who wants to only know about the three column model. And you can also add these qualifiers uh, to to the, uh, to, to the case in question. The goals of treatment, it's very simple. 
five, right? You want to prevent neurological deterioration. You want to promote neurological injury. We want to stabilize the spine. We want to restore anatomical alignment. And we want to facilitate early and active mobilization and minimize pain and deformity. Okay, so compression fractures, very simple. Brace or no brace for the majority. Uh, vertebroplasty, kyphoplasty, I kind of leave it to, are they failing the brace? I wouldn't want to go do vertebroplasty on a 400 pound, five foot two person. Um, knowing that their mass, the mass that's dependent on, on this vertebral kyphoplasty may fail really fast. There, there, there are pretty significant uh, morbidity associated with doing those cases anyway. Now, stable burst fractures, I tend to brace for the majority. Um, surgery is usually posterior, multi-level, or, uh, or if there's concomitant injuries, uh, we, we do uh, additional level. With the unstable burst fractures, surgery for the majority. Typically, I'll say anterior posterior for neuro intact or incomplete, um, posterior for uh, complete. Now, if we're talking anterior posterior, we have to coach ourselves into what kind of, uh, of tricks or, or what kind of uh, uh, cases can we do in our institution and what kind of training are you getting, okay? So flexion, distraction, we're talking posterior only 360 degrees for uh, severely uh, cord compromise. Now, as I mentioned, non-operative does not equal conservative treatment. Only a certain amount of immobilization can be tolerated by certain groups of people. The elderly, the morbidly obese, those with other concomitant fractures, they deteriorate with, with non-operative treatment. So you want to have a close follow-up with them. Lots of clinic visits. Sometimes they're not the best people to schedule follow-up. They um, and you also always have to have in your mind when you have the T-Lex, on the back of a flashcard that you tuck in somebody who's a PGY2 doing the T-Lex, uh, these qualifiers. Look at them, ask the patient, make sure that they don't have these qualifiers so they're not found wanting and everybody pushing them off at 3 a.m. and realizing that 7 a.m. rounds that we should have probably made arrangements in your operating room uh, to address this versus now the patient is already chomp down on breakfast and, and, and we're in trouble, okay? Most, most thoracolumbar fractures, they, they, they're the first to get breakfast somehow because unlike the cervical, <laughs> unlike the cervical, they're, they're, they're breathing okay, okay? So the, the um, things that I, I want to talk about these days um, involve spinal alignment and also not fusing my thoracolumbar uh, junction in kyphosis. Okay, it's very important to, to realize that yes, we're trying to we're trying to realign these patients as best as possible. A, a neutral alignment is better than kyphosis, and if it if it means taking off a facet so you can realign the spine is better. It's harder to achieve this when you're doing um, MIS uh, fixation. So you have to figure out if you have an MIS all the time for this. I, I prefer you, you, you do a mini open and literally um, resect a facet that's perched, particularly the thoracolumbar fracture. Not that it's going to cause neurological injury, but it increases back pain. Okay, So a lot of this has to also do with bone quality. Um, long constructs for people with very poor bone quality with metabolic bone disease, uh, DISH, ankylosing spondylitis. Please do not do just one above, one below. That's a recipe for disaster. Um, you may also need anterior column support. So the, as I mentioned, cases that include uh, osteoporosis, those are severely malnourished. I tend to, for those who have osteoporosis malnourished, I tend to try to do an MIS if I can, um, basically for wound healing. And also for osteoporosis, I'll tend to do multiple levels and rheumatoid arthritis. All these, all these patients do fracture a lot, even if they're on disease-modifying agents. And you know, uh, the last three um, may be those who have been on steroids you know, for one reason or the other. And, and I always worry when I do that. So we're going to skip over some of these cases in the interest of time, because I want to spend more time in the lab today. Today's the last day of the lab. Um, so we, a lot of you are familiar with, with uh, the uh, TLIC score. So this gentleman that I just flashed through, this is old school. This is, this is Dr. Skewen and Dr. Shaffrey on Dr. Skewen's last day of, 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 of residency at UVA. 
And of course, you're like, who took that picture? It's the idiot junior resident who came to close the case, and that would be me. Um, so this is a big, big uh, 35, 38 year old gentleman. So back in the day, they would, they would have a fibrillograph and, and try to uh, put a lateral uh, screws to augment it. Great for a 35 year old gentleman with the, uh, with the uh, MV, MVC. But, but these days, we're, we're, we're getting better. We're not doing a big shock bite incision to, to put the fibrograft in. We're, we're, we're trying to do it via the uh, minimal invasive approach. And I want you to spend more time, because now we're doing minimal invasive corpectomy. And I want to try to see if you could in, encourage Dr. Riurbe to, to try to do that um, for you to see that, yes, it's easy to, to extrapolate. If you've done enough lateral exposure to extrapolate and try to get into a, a corpectomy mode, and then uh, basically it's a very small opening. You expand your lateral opening a little bit, and you can put the same cage, and you can have a three-inch three, uh, three inch incision as opposed to our 12-inch uh, closed with general surgery as we, as we used to do. Of course, this is somebody with a, amazing bone quali quality, one-level um, injury, um, and, and very easy with an expandable cage as opposed to putting in a, a fibula graft, because we have to navigate sometimes uh, nerve roots and also vessels, okay? So it's very easy to accom accomplish that these days via MIS, um, and re recovery is faster. So brace or surgery, that's always something that comes up in m and in the morning rounds. You know, like, are we bracing because somebody wants to take a plane flight and doesn't want to do the case and wants to see them in clinic? or we're bracing because our patient needs bracing. So typically, it may seem like you're profiling the patient, but that's important too. If somebody's neurologically intact, they have less than 40% height loss. They're compliant, i.e. they understand what it means to be braced. It's not gonna fix them. It's, it requires commitment. You can educate them. They are mentally ready to receive a brace. They, they have appropriate age uh, and also body habitus can accommodate a brace, um, and also the circumstances of the accident, sort of, you know, it was a careless mistake, it was unavoidable, yes, I'll do it, a deliberate attempt to, to assassinate themselves, I'm not too keen on bracing them, okay? So, there, and also if you put them in a brace and they have less than 10 degrees of kyphosis in upright imaging, I think they're gonna do well. Um, there, Evidence, however, is really abysmal. It goes from case series to expert opinion to a collection of case series. So it's really hard to, to jump into to brace or not brace uh, patients. But I can tell you that in the best review that I, that I saw, the, the, there's a high level of evidence for short or long segment pedicle instrumentation without effusion, i.e. MIS, et cetera, and less evasive uh, percutaneous paraspinal approaches uh, for thoracic lumbar injury. The question is, are you taking the, the uh, implants out at a later date? And I kind of sit on the fence with that. If they come in, they're fused, they want the implants out, it's rare. You, you do, in my opinion, in adults, you do over 100, you may get one that wants his implants out. Um, but it's, it's something that's rare. It's more frequent in pediatric population. But it, the, there's lots of nuances to consider and technical considerations in the thoracic lumbar trauma. And I really implore people to take an AO course. I really implore people to come back to, to uh, the master's course here um, to, to learn some of the percutaneous fixation um, for thoracic lumbar trauma. If you don't do it in your, in your institution, I think it's a great skill to have. Okay, the best surgery, however, is the one that you can do safely in a patient. Okay, but Basically, you want to reduce soft tissue. Um, if you're just stabilizing somebody who's got a horrible kyphotic deformity and you have the mechanisms and also the ability to perform compression and distraction in these percutaneous systems are getting better and better every, uh, every generation. So it used to be that you, know, you couldn't distract or compress appropriately. When I started with MI systems, now it's just amazing and you wonder where it's going to lead to. But it does improve recovery time. Um, it reduces post-op pain. You can get them out of bed quickly. And, and also, you don't delay stabilization. But it could be cumbersome, OK? If you, don't, if you do these small openings, it could be cumbersome. 
it could it could also be a a, uh, a high learning curve. But and 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 but I implore you all to to try to get into these cases or at least visit places that do them before you you start on your own. And I always tell people sometimes it's better to just partner up with. With, with somebody, delay delay for the first three months. If you know you want to do MIS in your alma mater, um, you should, yes, it's great to come see one year bay, but nothing beats partnering up with somebody three months before you take your first job to say, I want to do this. I didn't do enough of this, and I know where to go. And I'm going to do it for three months. I'm done in July. I'm done in August, but I'm starting in November, and I'm going to dedicate time to doing this. Because there's nothing like being live with, with somebody else. It's very important. It's counterintuitive. It's sort of like get the job early. But I, I really think if you can be able to do it for five years, seven years, spend time. If you know there's a skill that's not you're not exposed to hands-on, it's best to not go be an observer, but actually have privileges in that place to, to, to learn from somebody else. And maybe even a traveling fellowship might be ideal. Okay, so... Literally, you can use MIS now for thoracolumbar burst fractures, flexion distraction injuries, um, extension distraction injuries, fracture dislocations. You can be doing corpectomies through MIS. So it's getting bigger and bigger. And, and when minimal invasive spine started, we, we always thought it was a, going to be a fad. It's now over 15 years, and a lot of the expectations that we had have been exceeded, and it just keeps getting better and better. And the evidence is out there. Okay, So be interested in that. Okay, so basically I want you all to have a uniform language for mechanism of injury. Implore your colleagues to use the same language if possible. When you're doing these sort of lumbar fractures, don't savor it. I, I can't stand people who savor cases. Step back and look at how great they're doing. You know, have a plan, stick to it, get it done quickly, and have an tr excellent trauma service to back you up. In invest in training your trauma team to back you up. Thank you.